Okay, cardiomyopathy. This one's a little bit different. All of the other ones we've talked about so far have dealt with specific infections that have caused, you know, rheumatic carditis, myocarditis, infective endocarditis. Cardiomyopathy is where you have structural and chronic changes within the heart muscle, okay? So, like, it's just changing. And when we get to the pictures, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about with this, okay? Um, there's three different types. It's called hypertonic, um, restrictive, and dilated cardiomyopathy, all right? The main thing I want you to know is that it's changing the actual structure of the heart muscle itself. The three types are described in your book, and so make sure you go through in your book and really review um, what these different types are, what the difference are, and how they affect the heart differently, okay? If you need to, pause the video now and go ahead and look at that, okay? Um, so after the heart has changed its structure in some way due to this cardiomyopathy, the heart is losing its ability to pump the blood efficiently. So for example, if um, if the muscle is too thin or something, then it's not going to be able to forcefully contract enough to push that blood through the ventricles into wherever it needs to go next, whether it's to the lungs or to the rest of the body. It's not going to be able to pump effectively. Um, it might develop without explanation. We really don't know sometimes what causes it, um, but it usually is going to follow some other medical problem, usually some other kind of um, heart disorder like myocarditis or following some other kind of autoimmune disorder like lupus, okay? And from here on out, you might see SLE, and that just stands for systemic lupus erythematosus, okay? So whenever you see SLE, we're talking about lupus. Or it can follow like muscular dystrophy or alcoholism or cancer chemotherapy. All of those things are very, very hard on your heart and can cause that structural, the structural changes to your heart muscle itself um, just over time. So here's the pictures, okay? Um, here's a normal heart. See how the heart muscle is good, it's an even, proportionate, nice, steady muscle size. Okay, here's dilated. This is where um, the muscle is way too thin. Okay, it's not hard, it's not going to be strong enough or thick enough to be able to force out the blood. And then hypertrophic means whenever you hear hyper, that's talking about like too much, right? So hypertrophic means it's just grown way too much the muscle is too strong and it's impeding the size of these ventricles in order to allow the blood to get into that space okay so within the space you have a smaller amount of blood strong muscle that's great and all but a decreased amount of blood which means that when it pumps out your cardiac output is going to be decreased to what it should be Okay, it's going to be less than what it should be. And then here's restrictive. Um, you see how it's restricting right here? It's a decreased ventricular chamber size on the left ventricular hypertrophy. See that? It's just restricting that left ventricle. All right. Um, the signs and symptoms of cardiomyopathy are different just depending on the person and sometimes depending on why they have cardiomyopathy, whatever has caused it. Um, but a murmur is usually the first sign that you are going to notice with a patient who has cardiomyopathy. Um, and remember that murmur is just that whooshing sound. Um, I want you to go through and listen to the heart sounds, okay, and see what this sounds like so you can recognize it when you're taking care of a patient in a clinical setting. Um, and it's different to, the signs and symptoms are different based on what type of cardiomyopathy the patient has. So with dilated, they're going to feel short of breath, um, dyspneic, they might have palpitations, some chest pain, maybe some fatigue, edema. Um, just because, you know, with the dilated, remember, look back, here's our dilated. Remember, the muscle is not strong enough to really be able to forcefully push out the blood that it needs to. With restrictive, they're going to have some exertional dyspnea, some activity intolerance, um, and maybe some edema in the extremities. Because with the restrictive, see, it's a disproportionate amount of blood that can form, um, or sorry, not form, that can fill within um, each chamber of the heart. And then as it's getting pushed out, it's just irregular. And so they're going to feel, especially whenever they're doing some kind of activity or something, they're going to feel really short of breath um, and not be able to complete tasks sometimes because of it. When they have hypertonic, um, they can have syncope, which means dizziness or near syncope, um, fatigue, shortness of breath, chest pain. To diagnose it, we just need to get a chest x-ray and really visualize the structure of the heart. Um, an EKG is going to show us how well the heart is pumping and the rhythm and everything. 
Um, and then a cardiac cath, we'll look at this procedure later down the road, but it's going to detect the elevated pressure within the ventricle. All right. To treat cardiomyopathy, um, we want to give them some diuretics just to, um, you know, take off the excess fluid as much as possible. And then antihypertensives and digoxin and anticoagulants to thin the blood. All of these are helping to promote your heart's contraction and cardiac output and decrease how hard your heart has to work in order to get the same amount of blood out. We want to give them oxygen, maybe some corticosteroids to reduce in inflammation, some sodium restriction so that they're not um, increasing their fluid volume, um, which makes it harder for your heart to pump out excess fluid. Um, perhaps a pacemaker. If their heart is not keeping up with the demands um, of the body because it's too slow or whatever, they might need a pacemaker just to help regulate them. Um, surgery is sometimes necessary just to remove thickened myocardial muscle. Um, and it really just depends on what kind of cardiomyopathy they have and how well they're living with it. Um, they might eventually need a heart transplant just depending on, again, just their um, ability to live with the condition. As a nurse, um, we need to check their vital signs, their heart rate and rhythm, look at their O2 stats, um, monitor if they need to increase their oxygen or, or anything, um, assess their eyes and nose as well, and assess for edema. All of those are looking at their fluid status. Um, administer oxygen if they need it. Um, and then just reduce their activity without limiting their lifestyle. So, for example, you want to teach them to take rest periods in between each activity that they perform. So if they have already walked outside, gone to their mailbox and back, Tell them to sit down for five minutes and then get up and maybe do their dishes and then sit down for five minutes and then maybe get up and go and, you know, clean their room or something. So whatever it may be, you want to teach them how to manage their activity and tolerance while not living their life. All right, let's take a break.